I'm Scott Knoll. I'm the editor of Dreamforge Anvil and Dreamforge Magazine. We're about to open up for submissions from uh, November 15th to November 30th. Today, we're going to take a look at things like, well, what are we looking for? How do we evaluate a story once you send one in? What are your odds of making a sale? And technically, how do you actually submit a story to us? If you're not familiar with Dreamforge, um, we're a science fiction and fantasy magazine that specializes in positive, hopeful fiction. We prefer tales where the human adventure is just beginning, where daring problem solvers overcome obstacles and even survivors of a catastrophe have to do a little more than just crawl out of the rubble. But it's time to submit stories, so what exactly are we looking for? What are our basic specifications? Shorter is better. Our sweet spot is 2,500 to 3,750 words. Overall, we'll consider the following word counts. Flash fiction, 200 to 1,500 words. Short stories, 1,500 to 4,500 words. Poems, up to 900 words. Payment, we pay six cents a word. 25 to $100 per poem, and three cents a word for reprints. We pay on acceptance, and we offer an industry standard contract. Preferred formatting. Your story must be in Word or RTF file format. Put your name, address, email, and word count at the top left of the first page. The title of the story should be centered a little below that, and your byline centered below that. Page layout. Make the font Arial, size 12. Double space. Indent your paragraphs. Just a single space after periods. No extra line breaks between paragraphs. You can have section breaks divided by three centered hashtags. And remember to put the title, your last name, and the page number in the document header on each page. When you save your file, name it the following way. Story title, last name, v01, and then .doc or .rtf. An example would be Pangenesis, Noel, v01. In case we ask for edits or rewrite, the second version would be v02, etc. During the submission process, you'll have the opportunity to write a cover letter, enter the word count, select the genre and story type, etc. We know that's going to be a bit of double work, but there's the story and then there's the submission log, and if they get separated, this helps us know what went where and what belongs to whom, etc. If you're having trouble keeping up with all that, don't worry. Just go to dreamforgemagazine.com slash call for submissions. That's call dash for dash submissions. But go to that URL. We'll explain it all there again in detail. So much for the technical stuff. What else? Well, we want positive stories across all science fiction and fantasy genres, but no horror. We're not looking for Pollyannish or utopian societies. We do want to see communities or teams striving to overcome problems. We say yes to marginalized and underrepresented characters as protagonists, uh, the heroes of the tale. We say yes to science and magic that actually solve problems and help societies move forward. We really don't want to see corrupt or governments or corporations. There's, there's just like everybody does that. There's, there's no reason to, to see more of that. Uh, we do want you to tone down the, the violence and the profanity and the sex a bit, unless it's you know, something that's really important to the meaning of the story, not just in there because you think it needs to be. And one thing you can really do is simply read us. Many of our stories are, are free online, and um, there are many that you can uh, you know, take a cue from in uh, sending something to us. So, so I'm actually I'm going to um, give you some links to some of my favorites, and you can take a look at those. You can best get DF by reading DF. We'll give you some examples in both science fiction and fantasy. Here are some science fiction tales that I really liked. 
Pioneer by Mark Gallagher, Sapiens by David Manna, and House of Bones by Robert Silverberg. We'll keep this up for a little bit so that you can, uh, can get those URLs if you're interested. Pioneer is a reminiscence, the story of one Scottish family's obsession with Mars and how they came to reflect humankind's longing and determination to become more than we are. Sapiens is a look back from a far future at our current time of climate change and apocalyptic anxieties, one in which a time-traveling anthropologist is fascinated by our lack of faith in ourselves. House of Bones takes us to the past, the far past, where we assume our species was at its most violent and genocidal, or maybe not. On the fantasy side of things, three of my favorites are Sid by Andrew Jensen, The Weight of Mountains by L. Denny Coulter, and Myself by Rebecca Enzor. Sid shows us that although the world can be an unforgiving place, we don't have to walk through life alone. Even trolls know that. The Weight of Mountains is about being tasked by fate with the impossible and finding within ourselves the strength, resilience, and self-sacrifice to redeem the world. Myself examines the selfishness of wishes and paradoxically how wishing to love oneself can lead both to the confidence to live and the generosity to give. You submitted a story, so what happens now? Well, it starts with our international team of first-line readers. That's a group that's made up of authors, people with MFAs, enthusiastic fans, and critical readers. They really are based all over the world. We have people from Australia and um, Norway and Germany and New Zealand, and, and it varies a bit from reading period to reading period. They, they come and, and go. I read part of every story, so there are, are no absolute gatekeepers to this process. What we do is we'll read the story and we'll um, rate it. We assign a five-star rating system from one to five stars, and we also make some comments and we talk about what we're seeing in the story and why it might or might not be appropriate. One to five stars in our system doesn't mean one's terrible and five is really great. What it, what it means is a one would mean, well, we really don't see this fitting into Dreamforge. It, it, it could, you know, uh, not be the best written, but it might also just have themes or deal with those themes in ways that are inappropriate to the magazine, but otherwise be a perfectly fine story that could be published elsewhere. A five-star rating, when I see that from a first-line reader, it, it tells me that they not only feel that it's a good story, but it's perfectly appropriate for Dreamforge, and they're willing to argue that point with me and, and explain why it should be in the magazine. But as I said, there, there are no um, gatekeepers, really, between me and the stories. I read at least a part of every story, and I have been known to buy things that the first-line readers did not like, and I have been known to return things that the first-line readers do like. Now, those are exceptions, but, uh, but they do happen. Um, and that's the way you know, our system works as we, as we go through the process of evaluating hundreds of stories and trying to pare those down to the few that we can accept and that we have a budget for. Because we've read over 2,000 stories at this point, we can generally tell when they leave the rails. A big one to be concerned about is exposition. People, beginning writers especially, seem to confuse that with story. Uh, what I mean by exposition is the world building, the, the history of the world, the personal life of the protagonist, uh, how this entire concept was developed and the universe in which it exists. Many people have a lot of fun writing that and, and the problem is it's not as much fun to read. So when we get into a story, often it's, it starts out in a very promising way and is engaging, and by the bottom of the first page or the bottom of the second page, the author starts to tell us all about the history of the character and how they became involved in this story and, and goes into the background of the world and how the magic system works or how the technology works, and that goes on for paragraph after paragraph or page after page, and it, it really just kills the story. And, at that point, we're basically moving on to the next story. So what do you do about exposition? Well, um, one thing you can do is simply leave it out. Uh, it's fun to write. Why don't you do this? Why don't you write a separate document on the world of your story as much as you want? Build it up in as much detail as you want. That's actually a good thing. 
But what you want to do then is you want to put that document over to the side and you just want to leave it there with all that knowledge kind of in your head. Now, tell the story. Have the characters go through whatever it is that they need to go through to, um, to you know, get through the plot and, and have an adventure and, and, and take us through to the end. But don't, don't explain any of that stuff that's over there that, uh, that you wrote about the world building. Because a couple things are going to happen. One, anything that's really important for us to know, it's going to kind of come across just, and we're going to infer it and, and, and understand it just because we, we have to see the character moving through the story. If you think about it, you know, in, in Star Trek, when did they ever explain the entire command hierarchy of Starfleet? Um, when did they ever get into detail about how a moneyless economy works? When did they ever explain exactly how dilithium crystals work in a warp engine with, with an antimatter drive? I mean, they didn't. They just basically made the characters go through the story. You know, the dilithium crystals are decomposing and the ship's about to explode and that's all you need to know. But, um, you know, they did have more of that built up off screen, you know, in, in the back of their head. So they, they kind of knew how it worked a little bit. But, but the viewer of the episode just needed to kind of um, go with the story and, and uh, assume that this was important because it was important to the characters. And that's kind of how you should work in your story. There may be quite a vast world built up, but you really don't need to tell the reader about it all now in the action of the story just concern yourself with the obstacles the protagonist has to face and, and how they're going to solve those obstacles. And if you get done with your story and you read it and other people read it and they really have, can't understand a particular point or they, they can't see why the story would work that way at that point, then you have a reason to go back to your exposition and say, well, this, this little critical point, I really need to work that in that somewhere. But uh, the minute you find yourself really just telling all about your world, stop because we don't want to know that. Another issue to talk about is character agency. And what do I mean by that? Well, that's when your protagonist, uh, your team members, that they take action, they endure risk. They, they actually take on the problem and attempt to solve it at, at some consequence to themselves. One of the things we see way too often is that writers want to keep their fictional children safe. And those protagonists don't take the risks. Um, they move through the story and there, there might be a risk, there might be a problem, but um, they don't really step up in a way to try to solve it. The, the action just flows around them um, and somehow still we're expected to see them as, as, as the heroes or the center of the tale and, and that just, just doesn't work. So in your regular life, you may be conflict averse. I certainly know that I am. But um, your characters can't be that way in your story. Uh, another thing that we see is third-party saviors. Uh, lots of times the story gets to its climax, and that climax is, is really just very risky. Uh, that final obstacle is extremely hard to overcome, and they don't see how their protagonist is going to live through it, so they bring in a third party, either someone who's already in the story, who, who just now suddenly has the talents to solve the problem, um, or a, a complete, you know, third party introduction that, that comes in to, to save everybody and solve the problem. And, and none of those are, are really going to be, you know, acceptable to us. We, we want to see your protagonist suffer through whatever it takes to, to solve that problem and come up with the, the spirit and the will inside themselves and the skills inside themselves to, to um, get the story, you know, where it, where it needs to go. So don't keep your characters safe. If you're cringing and and you know you you just you know don't see how they're going to get through this and you know that that if your character makes the next decision they're going to lose something or someone very precious and and they may actually even die in the attempt that's what makes a story interesting so go with that keep your uh keep your protagonist engaged in the story make their skills count uh, give them character agency a third major thing to be aware of in your stories is simply structure and logic think about it. Just think about it. Your story needs to start somewhere and go somewhere. It needs to be logical. Um, we see things like nomads who have settled in the same place for a thousand years. They're no longer nomads. Ice ages where Egyptian pyramids exist and mummies in the pyramids. Mummification isn't something you need to do in an ice age. Um, there's ice. Um, surveillance society where people in an office can't figure out who's breaking into the office fridge 
you know, to steal their lunches. It's, it's, uh, it's a surveillance society. So read your story over and just look for really glaring flaws in logic. Oftentimes, I think people just get so enamored of, of a particular idea they have or, or the thing that they want to say that they, they really just don't follow through in terms of uh, what, what kind of logic actually makes sense um, in that scene or, or in that world or how that technology would, would affect the entire world if it were used. So that's one thing we need you to do. It's, it's basically just, just read and consider whether you think everything makes sense um, in the story. And um, the next thing we're going to talk about is kind of story structure. And we're going to have a recommended structure to try to help you along. Now, not all stories need to have the same structure. There's no magic formula for writing a great story, but there are some patterns that can help keep your story on the rails. We have a basic pattern that we like that we feel is good for stories between 3,500 and say 10,000 words. Um, it has many variations. Uh, we just created one that, that we think you know, is something we can explain and that, that works well, and we call ours the robust template because we're making a play on the idea of robust and we're trying to throw in some Latin maybe. So let's explain that to you and see if it um, helps you structure your story um, a little with a little more certainty. The robust story pattern. It, this is comprised of nine specific elements that help your story by giving it an engaging structure. Those elements are orientation, character flaw, threshold event or inciting incident, the narrative hook, obstacle one, obstacle two, obstacle three, and the climax, and the denouement. If you follow this in at least some capacity, I have a chance of knowing what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go with your story. And it doesn't make all stories come out the same any more than learning the skills of singing makes all songs come out the same, even when the same song is performed by different singers. And yes, there are definitions for each of those items. We've explained them all in our robust template and gamified them in our story plotting game. And you can find all that and download the PDFs on the page shown on the next slide. The story plotting game. Check it out in uh, Dreamforge Anvil number 5 or at the link that we're showing you there on the screen. Um, what we've done is we've kind of gamified creating a plot. Uh, you can start with no idea at all and in about half an hour have a plot finished and in another half hour you can essentially even critique the plot based on particular point challenges. You can play this yourself, you can play it against a, an opponent, um, you can put teams together and have those teams play against one another and challenge one another's plots. Uh, so it's just another way of getting your imagination moving and, and getting you a story that has some structure and cohesion to it. And uh, uh, we have a PDF download of the game on that page as well as a download of the um, robust template which explains each of the elements from orientation to threshold event to what it means how you link the obstacles together and how they evolve out of one another and and how you you know create the climax and and um, you know explain things in the after action of the story it's it's kind of all there and as I said it's not the perfect template it's it's not how all stories need to be made um, but it is a uh, 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 a very good robust pattern to use in, in creating a story and and at least if you do that when I'm when I'm reading your story I'll have an idea of how the story's flowing and and what you're trying to do and it um, you know if it gets to the point where we're working with you it makes it much easier to work with you because we can explain things and in, in terms of okay well the story falls down here and here's why and here's what you need to do and 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 that all becomes a, a much more realistic thing to do with someone when when you have a basis of communication and you're you're working from the same foundation so certainly encourage you to check out uh, the story plotting game there's no cost to it just just uh, download it have fun see if you can learn anything from it okay let's talk about your odds of making a sale because they're really not very good um, everything I've talked about you know sometimes I'll get a um, 
uh, response back from someone I've returned a story to and and they'll talk about hitting the marks they'll say I, I read all your stuff I read your stories I read what you wanted and I hit all the marks why why did you reject me I, I constructed the perfect thing for you and what what they're you know failing to um, to, to try to perceive or failing to perceive is that, that hitting all the marks and getting everything the way we want it that that's just the ante to, to kind of be in the game we're going to receive in any reading period 500 600 or more stories one time we received like a thousand stories and i'm i'm really only going to buy out of that reading period they say 12 to 20 pieces um which is usually around two to four percent and uh that's because that's all i have the budget for i i we're not rich we don't have an unlimited budget we have have a very modest budget to do do the things that we do so we're only going to be able to buy a, a few pieces and and as i noted before it's not that they're the best pieces out of all everything that was that was sent in it's it's basically us choosing you know what we think is going to work best in that particular issue or the next few issues Part of the problem is that when, when you submit a story, it's just you kind of, you know, alone at your workstation and you've crafted that story and, and you're, you're sending it off to me and, or submitting it through the portal. And, and that feels like a very intimate experience. It's, it feels to you like it's a one-on-one -on -one experience and this is your best work and you really have high hopes for it. And, and you're handing it over to me and, and, and the reaction you want is for, for me to you know buy that to approve it and to basically say you did a good job and and we really appreciate that and we're even willing to, to give you money for it the problem is on this end it, it's not like an intimate experience on, on this end it's a lot more like sitting down in the evening to watch netflix i'm, I'm going to turn on netflix and and when i see that screen that i make selections from there's the, there's going to be 30 40 things on that screen and and I, I know that if I start digging behind the scenes, there's like 15,000 choices for me to watch on Netflix. So when I look at that and I decide, um, hey, um, tonight I'm going to watch Peaky Blinders instead of Lost in Space. Um, I am not making a value judgment that Lost in Space is a piece of crap and, and I don't want to see it and they really did stupid things and they don't know how to make a show. That, that's not the judgment that I'm making. Judgment that I'm making is that I, I'm in the mood for Peaky Blinders tonight and uh, that's what I want to spend my time budget on. And that's kind of how you should think of an editor at a magazine. It's like for, for he or she um, or they, that's not an intimate experience. It's, it's, it's basically getting that selection of 15,000 things and and many of them are going to be good and many of them are going to be worthwhile and and um, you just don't have a budget for that just like you don't have a budget to watch everything on Netflix tonight and when you watch the thing you watch you're not making a judgment that everything else is crap we're doing the same thing we're essentially looking down through and it's like by reading part of your story or even reading all your story we're we're you know getting into that idea of well what's this show about and and are we in the mood for that show and is that what we want to you know spend our limited time and budget on and and you know in 98 percent of the cases um the the answer is is no um it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing it doesn't mean that we think it's it's badly done it's just that's not what we're spending our time on this other thing over here caught our attention um just might be the week, the day of the week, the, the mood that we're in, the fact that we just read, you know, 30 zombie stories or we just bought five Mars stories or whatever and we don't want to, you just wrote one better than the other ones we, that we've published, but we don't want that right now. We're, we're being caught, our imagination is being caught by this other thing over here. Um, and that's, that's how that is. So when we return a story, it's, it's really not so much a value judgment on you as a person or, or your talents or your abilities. You may sell that story next week to another market because you had the right ante in that game and, um, um, you know, you had a better hand and, uh, than, than the other, you know, people who were playing and, and they just, just liked what you did and they, they said, great. It, it doesn't, uh, mean that they're, they're brilliant and we fail to see your talents. It, uh, it's it's just a thing um the market can be very limited uh and there are many players in it and we wish you all the best of luck and and we're really happy when we are able to pick um stories and especially if it's a first time sale and and something like that or if it's something that really we're really happy with we want to present but um but you know the odds are way against you so don't go in there thinking that that uh, that it's easy to sell a story and um it's just the way things are. It's uh, the odds are the odds are against you, and uh, we wish you all the best of luck. And we often enjoy reading stories that that we return. 
How do you submit your story? Well, Dreamforge has an online portal where you upload your story into our system so that it can be accessed by our international team of first line readers and myself. Watch this page for a link to the system when we open up. It's dreamforgemagazine.com slash call dash four dash submissions. When we are open for submissions, we have a full page online just with upload instructions. We have short instructions for people who've done this before and basically have the idea, and long instructions for newbies. And when are we opening for submissions? November 15th to November 30th, 2021. Do you have questions? Use the contact form on our website at dreamforgemagazine.com slash contact dash us. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, or Pinterest. Like this channel, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Um, we'll do some more videos to help you out with writing and cover other subjects, so we'd certainly like to see you come back. Support us! There are any number of ways you can support Dreamforge. You can subscribe, join our Dreamcasters Writers Group through Patreon, attend a webinar, kick in a buck with Kofi, buy merch at our store. All of that goes to fun stories. We volunteer the rest. So help us continue the human adventure. Go to dreamforgemagazine.com slash support dash dreamforge. Hey, thanks for watching. Life is often difficult, but the human adventure is just beginning. Here's to the next 100,000 years. Let's all imagine the very best for us.